Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome to Business Unusual. This is a live show where we talk about coronavirus and the ways it is impacting the way we work and the way we live. I'm Susie Jackson. I'm a news editor at LinkedIn coming to you live from my home in New York City. On today's show, we are going to talk about the return of sports. As a former college athlete, it is a topic I am consumed by lately. There is an incredible amount of money and passion interwoven in the sports industry. We have fans who want their teams and players back, who need an outlet from the stress that is our everyday life that we are living into now in this coronavirus pandemic. We have players that are feeling mixed. Some want to come back. They're, they're eager to get back to seeing their teammates, to get back into their games. Some are understandably concerned about safety, um, both their own for the, uh, on behalf of the fans, on behalf of their own families. We see owners and uh, venues, ancillary businesses that depend on these leagues coming back desperate to restart their revenue streams in a safe way. On the show today, we're going to talk with a panel of experts across the business and logistics of bringing live sports back. Uh, but first, I want to hear from you, too, during the show today. Are you a fan? You really want to get your team back on the field, uh, in the field of play, you have that outlet back in your life. Do you work in the sports industry? And I would love to hear what kind of uncertainties you're facing. It really uh, depends on the league, on the player, on the, on the geography. There's a lot of questions to tackle. Um, we're hoping to hear some of those questions and comments from you today. We're going to get to as many in the stream as we can. Uh, before we bring out our panel, though, I do want to check in a little bit across some of the major sports leagues. Um, we want to see where they are in their reopening process. So First up, I want to look at uh, the national U.S. Women's National Soccer League. They might be the first pro team sport to return in the U.S. with nine teams set to participate in a Challenge Cup in late June in Utah. No fans will be in attendance and there will be testing before and during the event for all players and staff. A really cool thing is that the league has said that even if players don't feel comfortable coming back, they'll still be paid their full salary and benefits for 2020. Over in the NHL, uh, one, another one of the early leagues to release details, they were shut down in March. They have decided that their season has come to a complete end. They want to allow training camps to begin in July for, uh, uh, they're switching for two hub cities to host an expanded Stanley Cup playoff. No official start date for them yet. Major League Baseball, they are in a heated debate right now with their players union about how to come back. The players in March had already agreed to prorated salaries. The league is now proposing uh, a condensed season played in region with expanded playoffs. They're hopeful for some home games by October, but the league is also now proposing a sliding scale for pay cuts with top earners hit hardest. There's a pretty contentious there between the league and players about the details of, of, of payment and how they might come back. The NBA was uh, the first league to suspend its season back in March. Multiple reports coming that they are in talks with the ESPN wide world of sports complex in Orlando, Florida and Disney World. Uh, to restart their season in late July. It's a neat venue. It's a place with multiple courts. It's a place with ample hotel space to bunk up for players and their families. The uh, CEO of Disney says there's no deal yet, but he's in daily conversations about it. Players in the NBA were able to voluntarily return to training camps earlier in May. Over in the WNBA, they were supposed to start May 15th. Still no word from them on when the start date might come. In the world of golf, the PGA is aiming to resume the Pro Tour in June. And they're already doing socially distanced charity matches. As you can see here, there was one last weekend with some high profile athletes like Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson, um, as well as current and former NFL players like uh, Tom Brady. I'm a Patriots fan and I guess I have to be a Bucks fan now and Peyton Manning. The European tour is set to resume in late July and the U.S. Golf Association has pushed the men's and women's U.S. Opens till later this year. These are just some of the details from the sports world. There are, are sports wide, wide around the world, different leagues, different teams and amateur professional levels. Everyone is trying to grapple with safest ways to come back for players, for staff, for fans. To talk through some of these challenges, I would love to bring out my panel now. Joining me, we have Pete Giorgio. He is the sports practice leader for Deloitte. Christine Franklin is an executive vice president at Octagon Sports, and John Bodenhammer is the senior managing director for championships at the U.S. Golf Association. Thank you all for joining me. Great to have you. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank you, Susie. Great. I want to just jump right into safety and logistics. There's no playbook for how to do any of the things that we're being asked to do in this pandemic. We are just all asked to wade through and figure out the best version of things as we can go. John, I want to start with you. The PGA Tour is perhaps the golf people are most familiar with seeing regularly. That's Tiger Woods on TV every week. You and the USGA, you're a separate body. You run the U.S. Open Championship. 
I know that you often have your courses booked 30 years in advance. Um, I want to ask you, what does that mean in terms of timing? What's the normal timeline for how you're planning these championships? And what does that look like now? Well, uh, typically uh, a U.S. Open, for example, the preparations for that vary uh, as to when we confirm the site, but we do work well ahead. Uh, we're confirmed through 2027 now. So preparations often start five, six, seven years in advance, but certainly by the time we get to two or three years out, there's a lot of work that's done. And this year we've had to postpone the U.S. Open from our June date at Wingfoot Golf Club in uh, New York, just north of New York City into September and uh, in order to play it because of uh, the pandemic. And it has meant that uh, after uh, five or six years of planning, uh, while we can use some of that, we've really had to start from scratch uh, in postponing it, a different time of the year to conduct the championship, uh, health and safety protocols that we're now <laughs> planning to uh, um, implement in a robust way. So it's really starting over, but we're super excited about it. The US Open fuels everything we do and we're gonna have a great championship. I'm glad that you're feeling so confident. We're talking about taking years of planning and condensing it down until you have about 130 days left. Can you talk to me about, you're thinking in terms of baseline scenarios. You're not even sure right now if you'll be allowed to have spectators come back in September. How do you think through executing this enormously complex tournament when you don't have all the information and you're not going to for a while? We need to be nimble. Uh, we need to be creative and innovative. And we're doing just that. Uh, postponing into September wasn't easy. Uh, typically for a US Open, you'll see, uh, oh goodness, uh, 40,000 people on site uh, each day, uh, about five to 6,000 volunteers uh, to perform a multitude of tasks. We hope to have many of those still, but right now we are beginning to plan and implement from a baseline. Uh, and what I mean by that, it, it, it'll be numbers that will be much scaled back uh, in order to get the necessary government approvals and to be able to implement health and safety protocols like testing of players and caddies and essential workers and thermal screening of fans that might be on site. And while it'll be smaller, uh, we are doing some innovative things to allow the experience to be really special for the fans. Those that are on site, if we're fortunate to have fans and we're cautiously optimistic, it'll be like an old time US Open in the 1960s or 70s. They can get right on top of the ropes and see the players up close. That is great. And I do want to get into some of the details in a little bit of what that actually is going to look like. But first, I want to say hello to some people joining us from the stream. Brett is here from Texas, Teresa from California, Wayne from Chicago. Alfred, welcome back to you. Uh, if you're just joining us now, this is Business Unusual. It's LinkedIn's live show where we talk about coronavirus and the ways it is impacting the way we work. Today, we are talking with a panel of experts across the sports industry about what the comebacks of sports look like. Pete, I want to turn to you for a minute. Um, John is talking to us about thermal screening for fans, et cetera. What functions are you thinking that teams and leagues are going to need to get into and be good at that might be really unusual? Uh, health, privacy, sanitation. Are there going to be whole new classes of jobs springing up in response to this pandemic that might stick around? I'm sure John will back me up on this, but there's so many organizations right now who have spent the last three or four weeks getting to be experts, like a lot of us on sanitation, on cleaning, on how to create the right safe environment for fans. Uh, how do you deal with, I mean, even things like in a, in, a, in a venue that requires elevators, how do we think about how many people we can fit on the elevators and what that means in terms of ingress and e egress. And it just, it's just raised a whole bunch of new and different issues that, that you know, are a lot of them very logistical related issues, but also a lot of technology issues in terms of this is really going to sort of put a new and different spin on how these organizations use technology moving forward as part of these things. Yeah, I think that the tech we're going to dive into a little bit as well. Christine, I want to turn to you for a minute. You work with some of the top brands that we see emblazoned on stadiums and on commercial breaks. They pump a lot of money into these sports leagues and their seasons. What are the hits like to those brands now? And what ways are you seeing them work with the leagues to try and influence comebacks? Well, I think what we've found in the last two to three months is that sports are so important than ever, you know, even more important now than they ever have been to people. I think it's so obvious that people want sports in their life and that they're passionate about sports and entertainment and that both properties and brands are working together collaboratively to figure out how best to deliver mm -hmm experience to fans, right? Whether that right now might be virtual or digital opportunities, 
um, and in the future a return to sports where they can come back to the stadium safely. But I, I think what we're seeing honestly is that there's a, a huge collaboration, even more so than there has been in the past, um, kind of putting money aside, I think there's a lot of collaboration between brands and um, properties and even ambassadors and players. Uh, you see a lot of the players going out on a limb to really connect with fans to stay connected to the games that they're playing. Yeah, we have Devin in the stream here saying, I'm not going to lie, I miss sports so much, but I don't want anyone to risk their health. John, let me go back to you for a second. You're planning this championship. There's a bevy of issues that you have to deal with. Every detail really has to be rethought. Can you give us a couple of examples uh, on the player side and in interactions that need to change on them? And then also, if you do are able to welcome fans back in September, even things like how do you get them from the parking lot into the arena safely? All of that, uh, you know, the lists are long. And when I, when I uh, <clears throat> said most everything changes, I mean that we're starting from scratch in, in many ways and thinking about things like we've never thought about them before. But in that life, an opportunity to provide an experience for the players that is safe, that is enjoyable, that is exciting, and the same for fans. I think from a player standpoint, that's what we're focused on now. They're the ones that provide the entertainment, the great excitement, the inspiration that ends up being a U.S. Open champion or a U.S. Women's Open champion. So their safety is paramount. We will uh, we will test players when they arrive on site. They'll, they'll be encouraged to be tested before they travel. And once they get on site, we'll we'll provide every single opportunity and uh, and methodology to keep them safe. Uh, and what I mean by that, it's it's all different from the time they arrive on site and how they arrive on site um, from the standpoint of how they practice. A lot of these players will come a couple hours early and, and want to spend hours hitting balls and, and interacting with people up close, their coaches, their physios. That's all going to change. It's going to be more socially distant. How we start them from the first teeing area, how they return their scores in the scoring area, which is really closed a close uh, in area where you have actually six, seven uh, players and volunteers in checking those scorecards. And instead of signing a card that you've been keeping for your fellow competitor, your competitor and, 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 and trading it with, for yours, we're going to, we're going to probably do that differently to, um, to maintain safety. And uh, all of it is around safety. That's our paramount consideration. And, and we've just got to rethink everything uh, and do it a little bit differently and in a socially distant way. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about, about the, the camaraderie, the traditions of games. I know the Portland Trailblazers are uh, one of the NBA teams who refer back to their practice arena. And they have a system where only four players can come in at a time. Mm -hmm. and they barely see one another. They're one-on-one -on -one with a coach. They're in the weight room alone. They're still isolated. Um, I'm really interested in, in, in how players are, are thinking through these things and how we're communicating with them. John, let me stay with you for a minute. How are players uh, in golf thinking through this? Are they excited to come back or are they hesitant? Uh, we, we are in very close uh, contact with the PGA Tour and uh, our, our uh, other allied organizations. And uh, we believe that the players are super excited to come back to play. They're great athletes. They're the world's best players. They want to do what they do best. And so uh, that'll start later uh, in a few weeks. Uh, hopefully, if all goes well on, on uh, with PGA Tour events, we'll be watching very closely what happens there. There'll be a lot of learnings as weeks go by and we lead up to September. Uh, but it is it is really uh, going to have to be um, thought differently. You know, just so many things that we normally wouldn't think about, even dangerous weather situations. How do we get people off a golf course when there's lightning? Normally we pile them all into a big van. Uh, same with transportation. When How do you get move thousands of people from a parking lot in buses? Well, we're going to have to think about that differently. Social distancing will be a big part of that. And and uh, you know sanitization and, and those things, but uh, we're going to get there. It's going to be great. That's great. I'm, I'm so glad to hear your optimism, Pete. I want to go to you for a minute. We're we're talking about trying to bring um, athletes back safely, but they want to come back to what they're used to, which is roaring crowds. Um, talk to me about what that teams are trying to do to simulate a fan experience for the players, so that they can feel like they're not just scrimmaging. Uh, and also, what people are trying to do to make the fan experience at home uh, more engaging. Yeah, I know it, it's fascinating because they do, you, you have got a bunch of different constituents that you're trying to sort through. John's talked about the athletes. He's talked about the fans, you know, there's press, there's a whole bunch of there's broadcasters, you know, in these venues and thinking about where and how we sort of continue to engage them in the way that they're used to, you know, there will, you know, most likely a lot of these sports will be coming back without fans and stands. And so what does that feel like to the athletes? What does that feel like to them? How can you bring some of that home? 
How do you and I, as fans, as people who want to engage with these live events, how does that change? What does that look like? And there's been a lot of focus on what does this look like, right? What will this look like on the broadcast? What will this look like on TV? There's been a lot of talk about what does it sound like, right? How does that, how do we bring that fan noise? And folks have started to experiment with different ways to bring that fan noise, both to the broadcast and into the stadium. Um, but also, I think we have to talk a lot about what is it going to feel like for us as fans to be a little bit more distant than we were? And how do we bring that in? Uh, for me, it's really interesting to think about things like how do we, how do we bring the kiss cam back? right, from somebody's living room? How do we bring that into a stadium? How do we give, you know, that 12-year-old girl the ability to hold up a sign with her favorite players at a, at a WNBA game yeah. uh, have that? And can we bring that into the stadium? So there's lots of really interesting things that folks are looking at, reusing the Jumbotron, bringing in televisions, creating more connections between the players and the fans during the games. Um, you know, how do you do the wave? How do we do the wave from home and can we do the wave and what does that look like? I think that you'll see lots of really interesting innovations and different things that leagues and organizations like John's will be trying to make that happen. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And, and talking about the Kiss Cam and the Jumbotron, those are things that are often sponsored by brands. Um, Christine, yeah. I want to talk to you. I know that Octagon did some research and looked at Australian news football, found that there was a huge drop in viewership uh, in the second half for games that didn't have any spectators. What are some of the brands that you're working with and partnering with trying to do to boost fan experience and to maintain that connection that they always have counted on in terms of what sports can bring them? Yeah, I mean, I think Aussie, Aussie Rules Football probably had the, the benefit of being one of the first and also benefited the rest of the leagues and, and um, properties in, in terms of giving some sample sampling and giving them um, a way to look at a pilot versus, you know, what they are going to do when they reopen their stadiums. Um, you know, a lot of brands obviously want to help with the cause and help with COVID-19 and are really looking at a, you know, more charitable things to connect back with fans. But in addition to that, what we're seeing is brands that we work with really trying to find an authentic place where they can be a part of the new experience. And I think what obviously this, the, you know, it's tragic that we're all in this situation and it's difficult, but there is a lot of creativity among the people in sports, among agencies that support it, and um, the ecosystem of people that work on, on sports entertainment is, is amazing. And I think we're going to see a lot of creativity come out of this with brands um, helping fuel that and also be more collaborative with properties. I think properties are going to be a little bit more flexible. Um, on certain things and maybe more strict on others. Uh, we have Marissa in the stream saying that we've seen a lot more fan engagement from sports brands. That's a positive. Christine, I know that you've also seen a lot more engagement from certain athletes on social media that maybe weren't out mm -hmm. there before. Can you talk to us about that and what might be behind that change in behavior? Yeah, I saw in the live comments that Fernanda uh, mentioned this as well. So I think it's great. Um, you know, players obviously need and feel a strong connection to their fans. And right now they're not playing live games or matches. And so you see a lot of those fan, those um, players and athletes bringing people closer to their personal lives and their homes. And I, I think it's great for fandom. I think it's awesome for the players to have some, um, some of this humility and, you know, seeing Serena Williams and Venus Williams kind of working out together as, uh, you know, as sisters is, is cool. Um, there's, there's just a nice tie back to them as people. And I think that will make the connections to sports even stronger. We have some folks in the stream who agree with you. Uh, Alfred is also saying bring the kiss cam to the house. He thinks that's a great idea. Alfred, I hope whoever you live with agrees with that. Um, he also wants to do that. we don't do it right now, Susie. Let's go. Oh, do, do we do a wave right now? I'm going to start. So it's going to go me, Pete, Christine, John. Ready? Ready? I am ready. Woo! <laughs> really good. Future of sports in real time on the show today. If you're just joining us, this is Business Unusual. It is a live show on LinkedIn where we talk about coronavirus and the ways it is impacting the way we work. We have a great panel of experts across the sports industry today talking about how live sports might reimagine, me, might reimagine their comeback. So, of course, a lot of concerns about safety. Uh, we have a comment in the stream here from Suzanne saying there's more than just coaches and players and fans. 
What about the people who work behind the scenes? Clearly, yes, mm -hmm. there needs to be safety for not just players and coaches, but who are the, the support people? Who's cleaning the place? Who's providing food and concessions and, and uh, safety protocol check-ins for anyone coming in and out of the system? It's hugely, hugely complex. Um, Pete, let me go to you for a second. Let's bring it out of professional into the amateur and see even the school level. I was set to try out for a women's softball team in New York this yep. spring, canceled. Um, what happens now as we are changing our behaviors, certain sports are going to be, be more um, desirable than others because you can socially distance, say, and golf more easily than basketball. Yep. What do you think does that mean 20 years down the line? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a lot of reverberations that we're actually just seeing. Uh, you talked a little bit about this idea that, that, that you know, these sports that require a lot more close contact are going to have some challenges in the short term versus some others that don't. You're also we're starting to see a lot of reverberations in the college world. Uh, I think you saw Brown University just announced yesterday, and they're just the latest in a series of schools that are looking at different sports, that they, whether or not they're going to be able to fund those moving forward. So I think there's going to be some interesting long-term effects that this will have on these sports moving forward. And I think, you know, amateur sports in the U.S., while at the same time in an organized way with your softball league and things like that are going to be challenged, in a lot of ways, I think we're also seeing uh, kids starting to play more sports, right? As they, as they go home, as they, you know, uh, do their virtual school in the morning and have more time in the afternoon. I think you'll see an uptick from that front. And it'll be interesting to sort of see how those two things play out and, and actually grow the base um, moving forward. Yeah, that's a great point about kids needing to get some energy out. John, right. back to you. Either, for either that or Fortnite, right? <laughs> My kids are being, I don't know what that is really yet. <laughs> Um, John, I know about 75% of the annual revenue for U.S. Golf Association comes from the Open. Um, if there's a threat to that business, that's the money that usually gets reinvested back into all the youth sports programs, all the consultations you do with courses. As Pete's talking about interest in, in different sports kind of moving and changing, what happens if that funding isn't reliable? You've got two things kind of happening at the same time. How are you thinking through that? Well, as I mentioned early on, the, the U.S. Open fuels everything that the USJ that we do for the game. We've existed for 100 years. I think uh, we're, we're a bit unique among uh, golf organizations. We're unique from the tour. They're the players. We're the ones uh, that really are um, that really administer the game. We're, we're, an, we're a governing body for the game. We write all of the rules for the game, the playing rules, the handicap rules, the equipment rules, so on. And uh, really, it provides a foundation for the game. And, and um, you know, I, I think uh, all of that is, is an opportunity for us to extend that into all that has happened through the pandemic. Uh, you know, you think about golf and being outside, there are opportunities to be outside and you can socially distance and it's just kind of a natural way golf is played, but there are all kinds of different requirements that governments um, ask courses and clubs to do to keep people safe. And so we've had to give guidance on the rules and, and we've tried to do that in a way so people can come out and enjoy the game. You know, even with our, our U.S. Open or even our amateur championships, our 10 amateur championships, we think it is an opportunity. I mentioned opportunities earlier to, uh, to play outside and for both players and fans and do that in a safe way rather than maybe being in a stadium. We think that provides opportunities for us. Uh, I think our broadcast partners, uh, Fox Sports, are among the most innovative in all of sports, uh, microphoning microphones in, in the holes and uh, different drone uh, flyovers that really are quite creative. I think this year you'll see a U.S. Open and a U.S. Women's Open that's different than any because partly of that. I think even our staff is adapting to it, working remotely for the last two months. We're doing more virtual training of thousands of volunteers. We're conducting rules education seminars for high school kids and golfers worldwide virtually more than we ever have before. I think there are going to be some some really benefits in the virtual world that will come from this on a permanent permanent basis. Yeah, you're, you're mentioning changes for your staff. We have Dominic in the stream um, saying that perhaps the workers could also be cheering during the games. We love the players just as much as the sport. I'm very enthusiastic about my Cardinals. Um, Christine, I want to talk to you too. John was just telling us about really creative new things, maybe microphones in the hole, in the cup, on the golf course. Um, what about other new opportunities? I, I know that uh, Octagon works with the National Women's Soccer League. Before all this happened, they just inked a deal with CBS Sports and Twitch to broadcast their games. That was pretty landmark. That's a fresh start. Uh, are there new ways to engage fans? Are there ways to find new fans now that them starting from go can take advantage of? 
Well, first of all, I'm really, I'm really proud of the work that we've done with the NWSL. They are an amazing organization. And I, I hope that in, in this situation, we get some more uh, women's soccer on TV in a great way. I think it's going to be an awesome opportunity having inked that deal with CBS. Um, they're certainly in broadcast opportunities for brands and also um, for fans to experience the game even more intimately. I think what, what John was the camera angles and these these viewpoints that people in in person or in stadium wouldn't have access to that we can now bring to fans that are watching from home. I think those are going to be really, really great for um, at home viewership. And I think it's going to increase the fan base. Um, a league like the NWSL, um, which has a, you know a smaller number of fans in stadium than um, the NFL, of course, they're going to maybe earn their fans at watching at home first, and then they're going to get them to come into the stadium. So I think it's just a, it's a different life cycle of the league, and it's going to be a great opportunity for them to use the in-broadcast um, assets to really create value back to the fans, but also to brands. I love that feeling of they're, they're going to be uh, available to so many new audiences now who can kind of come along with them as we're all ready to re-enter the world of yeah. the world event in person. Um, Pete, I want to ask you something related to that. It, and that's what if people like the remote experience? Um, is there a silver lining to that? Does that provide wider access to audiences globally? Like the NBA, for instance, was pushing into China for years. Is this a, an opportunity for every sport to find audiences, not just in their hometown or city or even country? Yeah, I mean, Adam Silver is famous for saying, you know, 99% of our fans will never go to a game. And I do yeah. think what you're going to see here is is some of the stuff that Christine's talking about will be new muscles and new capabilities that broadcasters and teams and leagues are going to develop. They're going to pay dividends over and over again down the line. This is forcing these organizations to focus on these new skills, to develop these new innovative concepts, some of which will just exist during the crisis and during this sort of a short term, but other ones will persist. People will say, actually, I really like that. And I do think one of those places will be how does it feel for me? Again, how does it feel for me as a fan at home enjoying these these broadcasts and these games? And how can actually I engage with it even more so like I'm actually there? Yeah, that's great that we can still have that connection, even if we can't be there in person. Um, thank you all for being sort of in person here with me. Today. <laughs> it's great to get your insights. It's my first live show wave. So maybe we can all make the Jumbotron with that performance. I hope it makes it worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Thank Thank Pete Giorgio from Deloitte, Christine Franklin from Octagon, and John Bodenhammer from the U.S. Golf Association. Have a great weekend, you three. Be well. Stay safe. Stay safe. And thank you for joining us on the stream today, too. On this Friday, we had a lot of great comments. Um, just a couple more. We had Cheryl saying that she would not consider attending a live sporting event until treatment or vaccine is available. Vincent says we offer stadium seat wraps to cover entire sections, which provide the team and league revenue to offset the loss of gate and food and beverage. So there's a lot of interesting um, responses springing up to this, new business opportunities, new roles, responsibilities. Um, we we'll try to find some silver lining in all this. This has been Business Unusual. It is our live show where we talk about coronavirus and the way it's impacting the way we work. We are live from the LinkedIn news page five days a week, and I would love to see you back on Monday when my co-host Caroline Fairchild is going to be hosting a conversation about being an active ally in the workplace. So tune in for that Monday at 12 Eastern. Thank you. Have a great weekend and stay safe.